So why don't I go ahead and start then? I guess I think I missed some of what you were saying because my audio um, bugged out again. So I apologize. Um, but so recording started. Great. Are there is there anybody from the public here or is it uh, that wants to make any statements? Uh, Denise, I see your real hand raised. You want to go ahead? OK. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, reading a um, more or less reading a statement that uh, a group of us who've been participating in the NESC meetings um, for a while uh, put together. Um, we um, we are hopeful uh, with recently passed um, state and federal legislation that uh, there are going to be a lot of new programs um, at, that will help Northampton to meet its climate goals. And what we'd like to do is um, uh, lend our assistance as we can. So there will be a lot of new programs and grants to learn about and things to advocate for. Um, so many of the organizations that we represent, Mothers Out Front, Climate Action Now, um, a group called uh, the Climate Emergency um, Coalition, uh, have already submitted comments to the DOER regarding the proposed opt-in stretch code. Um, and so uh, we're also advocating for an executive level climate director for this city, but until that happens, this commission has the task of moving the city's sustainability goals forward. So we recognize that NESC members have jobs and families, and that limits the amount of time available for you to do things like research grants and programs that could help Northampton move forward to meet its zero emissions goals. So we would like to suggest creation of a citizens committee that could provide research and community education and other support to the NSC. And so four ways that we think we could help is one by networking with other communities, for example, via the Building Electrification Accelerator to learn how they are moving forward. And I was just in a meeting the other day, yesterday, in fact, and there were 53 people representing 21 communities, including Boston, Worcester, all of the communities that have filed home rule petitions um, uh, for a fossil free uh, new construction code. Um, so the second thing is researching new programs that might be developed through Mass Save or other entities. Uh, third would be providing a monthly report of the work that the NESC is doing subject to your review, of course, that we would post on the city's website and publish in the Gazette. I think most people in Northampton are not aware of the work that you do uh, and the effort that you put into working towards our just and sustainable future. And so we think that's worthwhile to highlight the work that you do, and we'd be happy to help with that. And the fourth thing is um, conducting other outreach into the community to engage private building owners and homeowners in their efforts to lower their greenhouse gas emissions. So we suggest that this committee be given official recognition and a modest budget. Um, once a climate director is appointed, this committee would work closely with that person as well as with the NESC. Um, for example, um, Adele Franks spoke with Martha Grover, who is the sustainability coordinator for Melrose, and they have a volunteer energy committee comprised of 10 to 12 residents with a budget of $2,500 a year for outreach activities into the community. Um, and one of their volunteers added measurable objectives to their climate action plan. So um, this is a suggestion that uh, we would love to support your work. And um, so we respectfully submit that you consider this. So this is signed by myself, Adele Franks, Sharon Moulton, Susan Theberg, and Therese Hamerl. Thank you. 
Thank you, Denise. Appreciate that. Um, any other public comments? Um, well, this is Therese Hammerly, and I had uh, a public comment. Okay, go ahead. Can okay. you say, state your name again, please? Sorry. Yes, uh, my name is uh, it's Therese Hammerly. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, I'm on okay. audio Great. only. Um, so I have been um, tasked from the local um, energy advocates group to consider um, facilitating uh, some signage at the senior center which would, um, you know, tout the ground source heat pump technology there, um, encourage people to understand that technology, and, you know, as it's appropriate, talk about the, you know, the, the near net zero status there. Um, so I just wanted to give a very, very brief update on that. I have had, um, you know, phone conversation with Chris Mason, and I also did reach out to the new director at the senior center. Um, and we'll be communicating by email. I think that, um, I'm not sure if Sharon is on the uh, meeting. Um, we had mentioned that there was a, our, ho our hope was to have the kids at Smith Folk work on the sign construction. And I had told Chris erroneously, evidently, that um, we had a connection there. And so I just want to follow up and um, see if there might be a connection to Smith Folk from someone at the um, NESC. Um, uh, Therese, we could we could follow up offline. Um, there is um, Tim Smith okay. is here on the call right now. He just heard your um, uh, your response, but um, so I could either, you know we could follow up with that offline. The city's working on a signage anyhow. I think it'd be great to have Smith Boat kids involved if that's possible. Okay. So that would be with myself and with and with Sharon Moulton. I I I don't want to overstep and see if she, I don't know if she's on this meeting, but um, she and I were going to kind of tag team that issue. Okay. So thank you. Sure. Great. Thanks so much. Appreciate that. Oh, go ahead, Chris. Okay, I just want to um, ask Denise. Uh, Denise, you said you were reading. Um, you said you were reading something. That, could you send me your proposal yeah so I, I, I did i did minutes. send i did send you the final one just a few minutes before the meeting okay. thanks thanks okay are there any other public comments before we start the regular portion of the meeting okay i don't see any other hands raised um so um sorry about this uh, I think the next item is um, um, review of the minutes from July 21st. And so we would need approval of that for accepting the minutes. Does anyone want to make, um, um, has anyone had a chance to read those and want to make a motion? I'd move we approve the minutes. Is there a second? Uh, Louis uh, Hasbrook. Okay. Um, any modifications or edits or as is? I'll take that as is because I didn't hear anything about modifications. Um, so I guess we need a roll call for this. Um, let's see. Um, uh, Marissa Elkins? Yes. Uh, Rachel's not here. Um, Rich Parcelletti? Yes. Tim Smith? You're muted, Tim. No. Okay. Yes. Um, Louis Hasbrook? Yes. Gordon Meadows? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Did I get everybody? Okay everybody's face there. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Uh, whoops. Next up on the agenda is, uh, <clears throat> sorry, um, discussion of new monthly meeting time. So Chris, do you want to um, 
sure. talk about what you've discovered in this <laughs> multiple rounds of determining what's going to fit best for everyone? Right. So we had six people respond to the poll. Uh, and of those of that six people, the, the times that popped out the best would be on Tuesdays, either the second Tuesday of the month or the fourth Tuesday of the month. Every, no one seemed to like to go beyond 6 p.m. And we didn't ask anybody to go before 4 p.m. because of a, re, a request from the commission. So uh, four to six is, was always the time period people chose. Um, on the Tuesdays, uh, we had five out of six people, uh, five out of the six people responding said that they could make it. And Carolyn, I'm, I'm, I had heard from you that you had misentered some times where you couldn't make it. You were, so I want to double right. check that the um, that time period four to six on the second week or the fourth week of the month would work for you. Um. Yes. So there was one that I the September one. I think I told you I wouldn't be able to make because right. I already have a prior commitment. But it, that's that's a one off. Um, it's not a consistent thing. So um beyond that um both the second and the fourth would work from four to six okay so the only um only person who had a conflict was ben and that would have been in the first half hour so i think what it is he's not here to speak to this but i think that probably means that uh he has a class that would keep him from joining until 4 30. um so those are the times that popped out but it wasn't a, you know not everybody filled out the poll uh, so I, well, I'm going to put it out there, Tuesdays um, from four to six, either the second Tuesday or the fourth Tuesday. Uh, can we just pick one of those? I'm not sure if everybody here is on that. All right. Um, toss a coin. Does anybody have an opinion? Second uh, Tuesdays or fourth Tuesdays? Um, and the only the only potential conflict, I think, um there is a city council i think does legislative matters marissa do you know i'm looking at you do they meet on tuesdays or is it the monday mondays okay. i was one of the people who did not fill it out but tuesdays are, are fine uh for me okay okay that makes a seventh nice okay. <laughs> sorry um <Okay. laughs> Yeah, I, for some reason, I was thinking the second Tuesday could be a city council subcommittee meeting day. But um, if Rachel it, didn't, it did might Rachel be. respond? She did. Uh, and that was fine. Tuesdays were fine. I assume so, because that's what my notes say. Okay. That, that, that okay. many people. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, well, why don't we pick the second Tuesdays? All right. That sounds fine. I don't think we need a vote okay. on that or anything. And let's see how yeah, it works. Ho hopefully it works. Okay, so four to 6 p.m. on the second Tuesday of the month starting in September. So that would be, um, I believe that's uh, September uh, 13th would be the next time that we would meet then. Yeah. Is the date I have, okay. Um, <clears throat> Gordon's got a hand raised. Yeah, I uh, I wanted to see if we could return to in-person meetings. Um, it's definitely um, allowed and we can also do, um, the rooms are set up for hybrid so that we could have commission members in person and have members of the public um, at least listen in on oh, and or participate whatever the committee um, commission felt would be appropriate in either scenario. So it's really up to the committee to make that determination about which way they want to go. Should I poll everybody? Because because we don't have everybody here uh, for that. Should I uh, put that as a thing for me to do to poll the commission to see if what people want to go, which way they want to go? Yeah, I think that would make sense since not everybody is here tonight to, mm -hmm. to send that out. Um, and then we can make a determination, you know, if it's unanimous, that would be pretty easy um, to do starting in September. Otherwise, it might be another meeting round before that's determined if we were to change from 
um, remote to in person. It sounds like there is a hybrid mo uh, option with that, uh, which would mean to me that anyone who wanted to do it online could. Um, it would be nice. It would be nice to see everyone's face again after two years of of Zoom. And I think that a lot can get done with in-person meetings. Uh, they feel more productive to me. The, um, the one thing I'll say about that is that I, I believe that you would still have to have uh, a quorum present um, uh, to do that. So if we were just down to a quorum, then you know, you'd be forced to be in present. So I, I, I actually think it'd be best to talk to everybody. And also, I think w when we did the polling, um, people were probably imagining Zoom meetings. And so the time it takes to get to a meeting may have not been taken into consideration. Um, so I, I, I personally think a poll, a poll of members would actually be a, the best next move. I thought we were, I thought the rules were still suspended though, that the in-person quorum is, is not quite mm -hmm. yet required. Um, well, there was some right. thought that there was some thought that, that that wouldn't be renewed or Baker was slow sort of signing the order to renew that in like July, but he did at the last minute. So I, don't hold me to it. You should definitely check. But I think yep. we're still in the uh, a to like a total hybrid okay. uh, is is still OK for now. I believe and, that's right. Yeah. And the um, and I can I, I just by way of information, all the I think all of the committee council committees are meeting in basically in person now and utilizing this the hybrid situation in the in the council chambers and it's working it's been working nicely uh so i would just report that but as people consider their response on this it's been working out very nicely uh well in that case i'll, I'll adjust what i'll say how about if i poll everybody and unless something says no don't do it then we could try it in september makes sense okay Okay. Um, so on to the next item. I'm not sure if um, Chris, you want to talk about this one or not about this event on October first. Sure. Or although, if you want me to. No, I, I can do it. Um, yeah. uh, I mean, it, was, it it's an invitation that we received. Um, I think it actually you know, came through Carolyn's office, but it's um, there's. A group that's going to be holding a an EV test drive event on October 1st. And they've lined up a lot of partners and vendors, Massachusetts Clean Cities, National Grid, Eversource, Northeast Solar, PV Squared, Pioneer Valley Transit Authority, Smith College, UMass Amherst, New England Electric and Auto Association, Energy New England. Um, and they're looking to see whether the Energy Commission wants to participate, either, you know, by I think they're looking for either support. In any way we think we can, or uh, inviting us to have a presence there to kind of tell people what we're doing. Um, so that's why on the agenda it's listed as uh, action needed. Um, just want a response back from the commission, right? On um, what, uh, how we might want to be involved. Carolyn, did you have something? I'm sorry, I can't. My audio is terrible. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I, I think um, what there's um, committee and you would attach, Chris attached to the um, package, um, they are really trying to get um, the committee involved to sort of uh, um, showcase sort of what the city's doing in terms of electric vehicle um, infrastructure and um, um, have, potentially have volunteers sit at a table, you know, it's a four, I believe it's a four hour event. So, you know, if we could get a member or two members to um, have sit at a table during this event, talk about what the city's um, doing in terms of um, helping the transition to EV um, um, systems, including sort of charging stations, as well as any other work that the city's doing. And it's really meant to, um, I think as Chris said, showcase um, what's out there and 
provide opportunities for people to test drive these vehicles and give more information about the the range of opportunities for people. So that's really what this um, line item was, and and really to take a poll from the committee to see if anybody's interested in participating. But again, yes. Um, so I, uh, uh, Denise's announcement at the at the beginning of this seems uh, <laughs> fortuitously timed um, <laughs> for uh, for us to consider uh, uh, kicking off that 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 kind uh, and generous you know uh, offer. Um, it sounds like exactly the kind of thing that they're looking to help us with. So. Thanks. So Denise, I saw I saw a thumbs up on that. Um, since we haven't had a chance to discuss um, your offer yet, it's not on the agenda. Um, I think it'd be appropriate to put it on the agenda for next month. Um, of course, you guys can always do whatever you want without our official sanction, <laughs> I suppose. But you can't do it in our name, um, right? Uh, right. Like and um, and if if this is an event that is being sponsored by NESC or the city then, you know, we, of course, would need to have some information about what's happening, but we'd be happy to help advertise it at our events when we're tabling at other things, like we'll be at the Arcadia um, Folk Festival and other places. And so uh, those are the kinds of events when we could hand out information about upcoming events, in addition to then helping you with producing flyers or putting, you know, spreading the word on um, our websites online. So those kinds of things. I, I would say that to the extent that we, um, you know, know for sure we want somebody to, you know, from, from the commission to, um, to be at this October 1st event. I, I mean, if we formalize the role of this, this organized, that could be an agenda item, but I don't, I don't think we need, we have to defer, um, you know, saying that if that's the way, a thing they want to do to, to participate and volunteer and serve, you know, do service for the city, I don't know why we would need to wait. I, I can't think of a reason, but if somebody else can. Well, I also just want to clarify, this is not an event sponsored by NESC. It's not sponsored by the city. Recharge America is um, a nonprofit that is, um, um, putting on this event. There are two events in Massachusetts and their um, mission is really to, um, they actually have a contract, I think with, as a DOER to help essentially spread the gospel <laughs> about EVs. And so what they're trying to do is just get local partners because uh, to have, um, you know, like for instance, Smith College, find, you know, so people feel comfortable. Oh, here are all these entities in this community, in the community in which people, you know, live in Northampton. If they're, if they come to this event, they can see familiar faces and names and say, oh, all this stuff is going on around EV chargers. I had no idea. And so it's really their mission is to um, show to to um, sort of highlight what's going on in the communities, but it's not sponsored by the city. We're not we're not. Well, the only thing the city is doing is sort of opening up the parking lot behind um, Thorns Market to allow this to happen. And I don't know. I think it was I can't remember six or seven years ago. There was a similar event by the um, I guess the initial um, organization before this became Recharge America had something like that um, over by the parking garage. And so it's, it's sort of another um, one of those types of events. But I just wanted to clarify, it's not, they've asked us if we wanna participate with them because it helps sort of um, highlight all the different um, parts or pieces and programs and agencies within a community that are doing these things so that the general public gets a better sense of um, of what's what's happening in this space. So it would be great if if there were some information about um, I, I guess we could go to the recharge America 
uh, website and get the information from there yeah. to mm -hmm. post on websites and et cetera. Right. And Marissa, do you have an idea of how to just move forward on just this EV drive piece? Uh, I mean, I think that, you know, it's been brought up and we have the date. Um, I, I, I guess reserving that if somebody like takes a closer look and thinks, oh no, this is not appropriate, but it sounds, uh, I, I guess I would say we should do it. I don't know that we need to vote on it. Um, we can confirm who will go to the event um, as we get closer, but we, you know, we already have a, a volunteer. I don't think it needs to be somebody, I don't think it has to be some, a member of the commission per se. It can be a volunteer from the city or, you know, is interested in the work that we do. Um, so I would just propose that we say, yes, we're going to do it and make, start making plans to send somebody there or, or more than one somebody, so. Louis? So uh, in all likelihood, I'd be able to, to be there for at least, for probably most of the time, several hours anyway. And the one other question I had is, I don't know how many electric vehicles the city has, except there's a few who get those people that park the city's electric vehicles over in the parking lot, just kind of like solidarity or point and wave, or maybe we don't have enough to make an appearance. I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, if we if we uh, take all the uh, parking ticket office cart, you know, and and put them out of commission for the afternoon, we probably make a lot of people happy. <laughs> <laughs> and depending on how fast it goes, we might have a Ford electric truck from the PD, and might have an electric van, maintenance van from schools. I kind of have a feeling those won't happen fast enough. It's long long wait times. Yeah, I, I I could see if I'm available, I, I could see, you know, coming and being around for a while. I just, uh, once the, you know, once the fall begins, uh, Saturdays in the fall, who knows? Okay. <laughs> it looks like Gordon, you have a, your hand raised. Yeah, I just was going to ask for the date for this event again. October 1st. October 1st. Thank you. Yep. Does anybody want to have be, uh, be a point contact to help Denise gather information from the Energy Commission that they would provide out there? I assume, Denise, assuming that someone from your group would be uh, definitely willing to volunteer. Have Louie? Could do that. Okay. Thanks, Louie. Okay. Any other questions on that item? Okay. Thank you, Denise and group. Um, and the next item is uh, just an update and sort of heads up um, that it's coming, uh, well, a couple of sort of categories, but um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Main Street um, picture Main Street project and the lighting that's going to be um, part of that uh, redesign of Main Street, uh, as well as the upcoming fall capital improvements um, planning schedule. Um, and so first, in terms of lighting, this is really more of um, a heads up piece um, as part of uh, we're working now um, with our consultant tool design on the 25% design plans for the redevelopment of Main Street. Um, those are, um, and we we're working with DOT um, to get those ready. There will be a design public hearing in probably early October for that project. A lot of the details about um, the type of infrastructure, you know, down to the very specific, you know, functionality of each component that goes into the street doesn't really get finalized until the 75% design phase. So 
Um, it hasn't been finalized now, but there's a placeholder in the 25%, the draft 25% design plans relative to lighting. We've talked a lot to the um, consultants about our proposed lighting ordinance amendments and our, our current regulations and our proposed as they relate to street lights. Um, and so I think there'll be an opportunity, of course, um, for the Energy Commission to weigh in on um, the street light um, um, details in terms of the, um, the functionality of the lights, but also down to um, the illumination levels and the um, ensuring that they're meeting certain um, uh, lighting standards for um, make, uh, preventing glare and backlight and um, so forth. So just also a heads up that the lighting specs that they put into the plans, again, this isn't final, they just needed a placeholder to submit to DOT. The illumination levels are much higher than what we allow now and what we would allow going forward in our draft lighting ordinance. And they're aware of that. Um, they just needed to get the system into the document, you know, some system into the documents and that's gonna get fine tuned for the 75% design um, um, level of the plans. Um, and by that time, we will probably also have a draft ordinance ready to go to council. And so um, even though our engineers uh, for the main picture Main Street project have seen our draft, at least we can have those finalized and in place. So that's really just sort of, um, it's coming up and um, it would be great to get um, feedback um, from the commission on that piece. So um, any questions before I move on to the next item? Louis? Do we think that we're going to come up against uh, a, a conflict with the DOT people and our proposed lighting ordinance? Has anybody you heard anything about that? Um, we've been talking about that. We don't think so. So um, the, the big issue is you know, the problem with, there are multiple problems with the current light, the current lights as they exist on Main Street. The biggest issue we want to push to DOT is that we want to make sure the lights are in places that make it safer, safer for pedestrians. And so that they're in locations where those crosswalks are. And I think to the extent that we can provide that information uh, as rationale for why we want the levels where we want them and why the bug ratings have to be what we say they are, that it should, we're not hearing that that will be a problem. Um, the biggest problem is um, if we try to specify the precise manufacturer and lamp, because that then becomes a proprietary item. So we just have to be very specific about the output um, and the specs for the light and not so much the company, you know, the proprietary part of it, which becomes a problem. Um, the other thing to note is we're also in the process of trying to convince DOT to pay for the lighting because lighting oftentimes is an item that is required to be paid for by the community. And so to the, the, more, the, the more evidence we can show that this is really important to improving safety and it's part of the integral to the um, whole redesign of the street, we're still optimistic that that will be enough to get them to pay for the lights, but we also need to be ready to um, absorb that cost our, um, as a community if DOT doesn't pay for it, because it, it the problem exists that the lighting just isn't in the right place now, replace those to make it function with the new street that we're building. 
Gordon, did you have a question? Pardon me, I never took my hand down from before. Oh, okay, sorry, no problem. Okay, um, moving on to the next piece of this um, agenda item is about the um, capital improvements plan um, process, which hasn't kicked off yet, but it is coming this fall. And one of the things that is part of the part of the plan um, recommendation is to ensure that each department sort of looks at their capital requests with this lens of resilience and regeneration plan and sustainable um, systems and how we're going to meet those targets um, for um, net neutrality um, for built for city functions, you know, 2030 and then ultimately 2050. And part of that is sort of weaving that lens into the capital improvements planning process. And we started this last year, but we didn't. And at the same time, we had Pioneer Valley Planning Commission help to look at what other communities have done, both around the Commonwealth and around the country, relative to evaluating using an evaluative tool to um, make decisions about where spending is uh, um, how how spending is done by department and where spending is um, decisions are made and base that on um, how it, it gets us closer to meeting our goals with these big capital investments and um, last year was the first year that the um, finance department submitted um, questions as part of the capital improvements application process for each department. Um, but departments found it very complicated to figure out how to answer those questions, how to quantify um, what their requests were relative to the impacts. And so um, the finance director has asked whether or not um, this commission would like to take a stab at sort of thinking about, I guess, two things. One is, is there a way to provide technical assistance to the departments to help them figure out how to um, um, make decisions and um, with this, these um, questions in mind, you know, how, how do, um, how how is the budget request going to um, get us to um, uh, better meeting our goals? And there were so so um, the question really is: Can um, this commission can the commission help? Is, it, is there a place for the commission to do this work? And is it something that you all would be interested in doing? And then, and just also to fill in the background, there wasn't a lot of information nationwide about cities that are doing this. And some cities, even in Eastern Mass, you know, Cambridge, Somerville, they are trying to evaluate this when they're focused on very specific projects. And they're even looking at the private sector um, applications that are coming in and just looking at project by project evaluation and not so much, um, you know, um, funding, sort of planning for funding for these big capital investments. And so it's been sort of hard to find an apples to apples correlation for Northampton. Um, one, because some of the bigger cities that are doing a lot of stuff are just, the scale is just too, big compared to what Northampton needs, but also they're sort of off on these other um, um, sort of targeted or focused areas. And so we have um, we've, we have a list of example communities that have done this, but we haven't really been able to figure out a way to incorporate that into Northampton's process. Um, and I can send you, if it makes sense to sort of start this conversation, can send you what Pioneer Valley Planning Commission's recommendations were and the communities to look at. 
if this is something that you all think makes sense for you to um, sort of dive down uh, deeper into and, and sort of help um, crack this piece of the puzzle. Um, I, I'd like to offer just sort of by way of observation that I was, I was, so I was on the, um, the, oh, I forget what they call it, but it's a, it's advisory committee. It's not, uh, it's not subject to open meeting laws, but the, of the, the advisory committee to the mayor. And so before I was sworn in, I was on Dave Narkowitz appointed me from the planning board to this capital permit projects and then prioritize. And so I saw them go through this process and start asking these questions and I, so I would, and now having had the benefit of sitting through these meetings and, and understanding the depth of expertise here, I, I would offer, absolutely, there's a role, um, I think, um, for for this, uh, not for everybody, like I couldn't do it, <laughs> but I can I definitely think that, um, that, that there's some expertise here that could definitely begin to hone down on the kinds of questions and directions uh, uh, to, to give to the department heads to ask better questions so that they can inform that process more. So that's my observation is yes, y'all should do it. Not me, y'all, you you people. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I mean, just as an example, so the questions that were um, identified as part of this process were, you know, um, explain how the project advances climate resilience. Um, and so how does it prepare for a different climate um, to address, you know, flooding, storms, heat waves. How does it build social resilience for climate change? Is there any effect on climate resilience? What are the positives? What are the negatives? How does this new investment, how is it carbon neutral or carbon negative? Does the investment reduce the city's greenhouse gas emissions? Um, or does the investment have no effect on those? And so, you know, I know for just pick out an example and Rich, you might be able to clarify some of this for me, but you know, I know that Donna Lescalea had a problem, like she needed to put in the capital investment plan money for new water and sewer pipes. So she was having a very difficult time trying to tie the need for replacing water and sewer lines with these questions. And um, that's just, you know, one example of many, but every department is gonna have an ask for these things. And we really need to be thinking, maybe, you know, maybe there is no net gain or loss with some of these capital investments, but um, if we don't ask the question and get people to think about it, then we will likely miss opportunities to sort of adjust what we should be focusing on in terms of purchases, because these capital investments are long-term um, financial outlays for, you know, pieces of equipment or things that have a lifespan of longer than 10 years. So it's, it's um, these are things that we're going to be using for that amount of time um, in sort of the simplest terms. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, Carolyn, I think it's it's hard, for example, like trying to purchase a vehicle, it's almost in a sense like there should be almost a manual. So every department head would have a manual they could have, that they could look at the particular purchase. And then what is the metrics of that purchase? Like how much CO2 does a, a five ton dump truck give off over a 10 year period? You know, what is the city's carbon offset going to be to to mitigate for that CO for that CO2? And it's, um, I think just from that perspective alone, just that one thing, it's where, you know, like, where do you, where do you find that information? You know, how do you get that information? How do you clarify the information when you're doing your um, capital improvements request? So I don't know if there's other communities that have a similar system or using or implementing this, this um, type of capital request around climate change and carbon neutrality. Do they have some kind of a source that uh, we could use uh, to help department heads answer these questions? Or, uh... um, 
And I would also add that uh, to, to sort of round out the inquiry is to also um, reframe the resilience portion of it. Um, because sort of the, the net neutrality, I mean, that's that's one thing that's a, um, you know, that's about our, our footprint and our, uh, you know, what we're doing to reduce that. But then the other, I there, are, it seems like a separate set of questions that go into, that something may go into resilience more than it goes into um, uh, sort of net zero and, and our, our climate output. And so Donna's okay. issues with the, with the, the sewage and water pipes, that's all, I mean, to me, like to me, the, the, the answer is obvious that that is about our resilience uh, in the face okay. of what the fallout from climate. And so I think we need to give department heads a way to fit that in the rubric that like, it's not all right. about the output. It's also about our, our carbon footprint. It's also about what are we gonna do when the inevitable comes and how how are, how is this gonna make us better able to respond as a city, so. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Um, yeah, Marissa, I totally agree with you. Uh, and uh, I mean, it, it can go be expand out a little bit more like um, replacing culverts. Um, you know, nowadays you don't just replace a culvert with a culvert because we're going to expect bigger storms, so you need a bigger culvert. Um, uh, and towards Rich, what your comments, you, you know, the CO2 output from uh, different vehicles, that can be calculated out. Um, so it's really going to be rather particular for each department. Uh, it seems like it wouldn't be a bad idea if, to have a subcommittee. Uh, and, I, and I'll put out there an initial, initial place to start could be, and I don't know until I look at it and, uh, and with, with new eyes, but the Climate Resilience Regeneration Plan, uh, you know, and just see what department has been asked to do what, um, uh, and then kind of take a look at each one of that and say, well, how do we, how do we guide the department? How do we provide guidance to the department for each one of these? Um, uh, and then that feedback would have to come back to the capital improvement planning process because last year we, you know, we dumped out a bunch of ideas, a bunch of questions, but um, they may not be the best questions. Those might not have been the most appropriate questions to ask. Um, they might, might be more specific. They might be different for different departments. Um, but I think it would take a, you know, a small group kind of getting together and uh, putting their heads together and tackling this idea. I think it'd be great for the Net Energy Commission to come up with some small subgroup um, um, to take a look at this project. And, and you know, I don't know if this is good. I'm sorry, Marissa, go ahead. <laughs> I, you know, I don't, I'm gonna, I'm just sort of talking out loud. So this might have really bad <laughs> implications, but you know, it's almost as though there need, there's a little bit to jump off to this, to get to sort of where departments are comfortable in evaluating this stuff. It's almost like there's a little handholding that needs to take place and having a group of people with the expertise to sort of look at this um, department by department. So um, if there is a subcommittee, for example, let's say we know that, you know, the school department wants to do X, Y, and Z request in their capital plan. Maybe the subcommittee could work with whoever's developing that plan, the school committee to say, okay, here's what's, you know, here's how you should be thinking about this or framing it, or maybe you need to, you know, maybe there's a way to look at an alternative device thing, you know, um, um, rehab or whatever it is. And I, and actually now I, maybe school department's the wrong department to pick on because I don't know how integrated they are with um, Chris with central services in terms of making those big capital investments. So maybe that just comes all through central services anyway. But that, I'm just sort of using that as an example that um, it seems like um, there is a little bit of um, just sort of guidance that's needed at the outset to sort of establish um, a means to um, sort of rethink um, this capital program process. Marissa. Um, I kind of wonder if um, as part of that, um, as part of that subcommittee, if, if it would make sense to bring in um, like um, our first responder departments, um, 
I mean, just because when I think of resilience and I think about, you know, the effects of climate change and that component of it, we're really talking about how are we going to respond when, when the worst happens. Um, and, um, um, and I, I, I kind of wonder like that that's how you marry the sort of resilience and the, um, and the sustainability piece of it. And, 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 and I kind of wonder, it seems to me like the, the output of this ought to be maybe a, a questionnaire, a set of, a, you know, a thing to give to the department heads or, or, you know, people working up these projects that are like answers the specific questions, unless that they have to come up with the metric that justifies theirs is just that if they go through the process of thinking through it, that gives the the people deciding information about, you know, about where it stands as opposed to like a metric. But um, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to overthink the sort of resilience part of it, but did y'all, I'm sure you all saw the articles about California and the like, oh my God, that's terrifying. Uh, the so megastorms, yeah, the megastorms yeah. and uh, and the flooding and coming coming from the land of 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 hurricane. See, I mean, I I, I that's where it's, uh, to me that's what resilience is going to be all about: responding to to the natural disasters that are caused by climate change. And I think that's a real piece of the puzzle. So I would I would suggest that that maybe we bring in the fire and and. It, maybe fire. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure about police, but, um, but. Yeah. Okay. Um, Gordon. Yeah. I, I wonder if there's a way to make ourselves more accessible to the departments. You know, I've been on the commission for four years, uh, never been asked to join a meeting outside of this commission. And I wonder if all of the department heads even, know that uh, the people on this commission exist as a resource to them, I would be more than happy to go to any meetings that I was asked to go to uh, where I could be useful. Um, and so I would love to find a way to make ourselves more accessible uh, in these meetings uh, to the department heads to, to help facilitate uh, that kind of planning. Okay. Right. Okay. For us. Um, yeah, um, I was going to just toss in, Marissa, I think your idea is great. Uh, I think it may have happened partly through the development of the CRRP. I assume that, that there was input from the department heads uh, for the resilience portion of that. But if there's a subcommittee, and I, I, let me let me uh, actually say I would I'll be volunteered to be on that subcommittee, <laughs> even though I'm an ad hoc member. If there was a subcommittee to kind of look at this, um, uh, I think reaching out to the department heads, uh, if need be, would be a natural piece of it. Um, uh, you know, communicating with them as need be. And Gordon, that kind of leads to that kind of response to you a little bit too. That you know, if that's the way we approach it. Uh, you know, it would be us reaching out to them um, to see if we can offer assistance of some kind. And I also think the subcommittee, the subcommittee, you know, if we look, and I don't know where it'll go until you take a look at it, you start looking at it in detail, but it may mean saying, well, we know someone at UMass um, that we should bring that person in. Um, uh, there may be other resources that we can uh, tap. Um, there's some expert on culverts out in UMass, uh, you know, so maybe they need to be accessible to the DPW. Um, this is examples. So maybe then in preparation for the September meeting, could uh, uh, heading leading into that meeting, sort of put the tickler out there to think about subcommittee membership for this particular committee, CIP committee. And then we can also attach the questions that were in the last year's CIP form to sort of start thinking about how, um, if we do keep those same questions, you know, how do we better um, relay the information and connection to the department heads about how to how to use that in you know evaluating the ask um, and then that can be sort of an item for the September um, discussion if that makes sense okay okay uh, let's see what's up next um, is this you Chris um, 
So I guess we have follow up from previous meetings. Um, do you have a status report, Chris, on any of these? Nope. Um, no, that was that was just uh, it, it, an opportunity for a status report. But uh, Rachel's not here. Marissa, I don't know if you were working. This, this is you were uh, uh, fossil fuel free construction ordinance. The um, 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 the update is is that um, Adele um, very uh, kindly um, spent some time and incorporated some of the things that we talked about the last meeting, and we have forwarded that to um, Alan Seawald and to the mayor um, for review. We we certainly want to make sure it's um, uh, that it gets the recommendation and a, a thumbs up at that level, um, you know, before we introduce it to council. Because when when we do it, we want to. We want to, I mean, there's time in the council um, process um, for, um, obviously for work, but if there's anybody who's gonna have a significant issue about it, we wanna hear about it at this stage, not not after. So, so that's the update, it's moving along. Okay. Oh, and so Rachel's not here for the other item either, right? Well, the other the other item is is different, and and actually we we have a uh, hand up from Denise. You want to... Okay. So the mowing subcommittee report is going to be from Gordon. Um, they had a subcommittee. Uh, actually, might have been Rich and Gordon, but Denise, did you have a comment on? Uh, the fossil fuel free ordinance? I did. I just wanted to say that um, at the meeting that I uh, mentioned, the um, building electrification accelerator group, there was some discussion. So now that, so there's a little uncertainty, I guess, about the way forward for these home rule petitions, um, in particular because. Um, uh there's some language about an application and so people aren't sure if they already have filed a home rule uh, petition if they need to also file an application there's a lot of questions but other thing is that some of the towns that already have applied and would sort of naturally be in that first 10 um uh, are uh, well, they probably won't qualify because there's a rule that you have to have at least 10% subsidized housing to qualify. And they also want to make sure that their petition doesn't interfere with Boston's now that Boston has decided to file one. And um, anyway, so those are just things that uh, we might need to think about. Um, as we move forward uh, with this. Um. And so, Marissa, I just want to clarify actually what you guys, what you sent to the mayor was um, really um, not the ordinance um, language. It had some elements of the ordinance language, but it was um, a uh, petition or a um, resolution, right, for a council to submit to be um, considered by the legislature. Is that is that what you're referring to? No, I we sent forward language for a home rule petition. Uh, okay, and then because there are two, um, because there are a couple of things going on. There's this like pilot project with the ten, <laughs> but then there's also right. a number of cities who've done this. Um, <clears throat> who've just done home rule petitions. I think the thinking really is, is that the home rule petitions as home rule petitions are want to be are pretty, not not super likely to get passed, but it'll be part of, a, you know, the movement toward, yeah, you know, expanding, expanding pressure that they right. need to deal with this. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. But Denise, right. what you were pointing out was that some people were worried that they're gonna pick small towns for that 10 and 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 well, off that, Boston. Yeah, that so as people rush to be among the 10, they were worried that they might be obstructing people like Boston, who's already indicated that they're filing one, and Worcester, who's sort of on the fence, but hopefully they're going to also. So anyway, um, yeah, I don't know how that'll all play out. I agree that uh we want everybody to apply. <laughs> We'd like like 351 
towns and cities to apply, but, um, you know, yeah, it, it is a, it is a um, statement as well as a, a desire to implement what we're asking. Great. Okay. Thank you. So then, um, Gordon, you want to talk about the mowing subcommittee? Yeah, I'd be happy to, uh, or Rich. I don't know if Rich would like to start off. He brought an enormous amount of information to the meeting. Rich, would you like to kick this off? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Gordon. So um, we met on the 3rd of uh, August at 6 p.m. for about an hour, uh, Gordon, Rachel, myself, um, to basically just sort of kick off uh, a discussion about um, mowing locations and properties across the city and what their functionality is. So uh, we came away from the meeting basically realizing that, I mean, realizing that there's multiple stakeholders uh, in the municipal side. Uh, for example, uh, you know, there's DPW, obviously central services uh, maintains a lot of uh, uh, mowing properties, uh, planning sustainability maintains um, properties uh, with mowing, whether it's yearly, uh, or I mean annual or regular routine mowing. Um, Smith Volk does a tremendous amount of mowing. Um, so we were trying, we're, we were hoping to actually talk to each one of these different stakeholders to try to get a sense of um, the kind of mowing, uh, you know, for example, uh, whether it's uh, functional, whether it's uh, recreational, whether it's ornamental, um, and where it is, and if if it's possible to take a, a long look at some of these places um, and actually maybe change them into pollinator habitat. Um, so we we're our next meeting. I think Gordon is the thirteenth of September. I That's think it's like we tentatively said we were going to meet again. And Tim, I'm, I actually owe Tim a phone call because I wanted to ask Tim if he would be willing to come to the meeting just to kind of give us a, um, a lowdown of what Smith Folk mows and where. I mean, I know a lot of the stuff just from working here, but not not everything. So, I, Tim, I'll reach out to you in an email. Okay, uh, He's good. But... Um, and then, uh, Gordon, I, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about um, the educational aspect of it, the educational piece about once we have all this information, trying to how, how we'd like to actually share this information and where we go with it all. Yeah, sure. So I just want to jump back to one of the things that you said, which I think is critical, and that what we really want to be doing is to be identifying the types of mowing that we're doing. And Rich mentioned the three types of mowing that there are horticulturally. There's functional mowing. So that would be uh, mowing for safety around road edges, uh, things like mowing the dikes, uh, to keep the grass in place. Then there's recreational mowing, so mowing uh, recreational spaces such as ball fields. And then there's ornamental mowing, which is simply mowing by choice uh, to uh, maintain space uh, as a visual choice of, of putting grass in. And I think that what we're hoping to do is to identify areas which are ornamental, uh, which are simply mowed because we have made the decision historically that mowed grass is what looks best in those spaces. And what I think uh, the consensus is um, in the um, conservation, uh, you know, folks, is that we really need to increase pollinator habitat as much as possible to avoid uh, potential collapse in our pollinators. And so what we would like to do is to work to convert as much space that is currently mowed for ornamental reasons over to pollinator habitat. Uh, and 
in order to do that, we will need to do an educational campaign. Um, things like putting up signage simply to inform the public that we haven't decided to not mow because we're lazy, but that we have decided to not mow in order to support our pollinator species uh, and wildlife. And so that would be things like signage for spaces that we convert from mode to uh, meadow spaces. Um, and it would also require, I think, uh, an education campaign on uh, how to respond if you're bitten by a tick. I think that a lot of people believe that we have to mow in order to avoid ticks. And of course, everyone has had a tick on them from walking through the grass. And so I think that not only do we need a, a campaign of signage to inform people what we're doing, uh, but that it would be a good thing for us to create some kind of an educational campaign on how to deal with ticks. Um, for instance, uh, as someone who works outside and, and has ticks on me regularly, I know that I have 72 hours from the time that I'm bitten by a tick to get a dose of doxycycline in me to avoid uh, tick-borne illnesses. So that when, you're, when I am bitten by ticks, which I do have happened to me, I know that I don't have to panic, that it is not an, an emergency, and that as long as I get a prescription for antibiotics from my doctor with a, within 72 hours, that I'm going to be fine. And I think that that is something that is generally not known in the public. So I think that that is, that is going to have to be a piece of the educational puzzle. Um, we did not come to any kind of conclusions as to how much of the ornamental lawn space we would like to have converted. I would personally like to see as much as possible. Um, and I think that that's where, come, where speaking with all of the stakeholders becomes important so that uh, the, uh, say, uh, people at the schools can help to make that decision as to how much of their ornamental lawn they would like to see converted over to meadow. Um, so I am, I am looking forward to beginning that process uh, and would love to hear any feedback from, from the greater commission. Oh, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, hey, I don't wanna jump on anybody's feedback. I just have a few questions. So the tentative meeting was September 14th. Was that what it was? I'll make sure I get that right. September 13th. 13th. Okay. That's a Tuesday at 6 p.m., I believe. Oh, right after our meeting. <laughs> yes, which I which I didn't didn't realize until today. <laughs> hmm. Well, no. Are we well, you guys could have a mega meeting. You could just go from this meeting to your <laughs> subcommittee. Be like a marathon meeting. <laughs> I hate. I think that's what they were trying to avoid on Thursdays. Um, <laughs> the city councils, right? Well, we haven't we haven't posted an agenda yet, so we can always we can always adjust it if that would. Okay. Be the case. So, anyways, but, but uh, I'll I keep will... you. Posted. Okay. Plus, I I will be drafting the minutes, Chris, as well. But we will approve them at the next subgroup meeting. And that was my second question. Perfect. Yes. Yep. Okay. So actually, I think subcommittees have to bring their minutes back to be approved by the whole commission. Is that it? When I've worked on subgroup or subcommittee meetings, uh, no, we do the. I think the they're sub, just subcommittee. There's just okay. subgroup. Yeah, that makes more sense. But because we're meeting again, we're just going to approve them in our subgroup meeting, and then I will get them to you to post with, with the, the with the full commission meetings minutes. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So okay. everyone can read them. Yeah. Right. Okay. So speaking of mega meetings, I have to I have to eat before mm. my next thing starts. So and, and make <laughs> and make and make food for other people who need to eat. So um, I'm I'm going to depart the meeting a little bit early. I apologize, but I have another meeting later. So um, you guys have a great after, uh, rest of your evening, and uh, some of you maybe I'll see on the Zoom again in a little bit.
<laughs> I don't think there are that many things left on no. the agenda. So, um, uh, I, um, I just had a follow up on that Gordon's comments. I think it's great to have this sort of a subcommittee that talks about sort of all the pros and cons and the different areas that you might want to target. Um, it might be beneficial to really bring in um, public health officials before making any kind of education statements about what the procedure is if you are bitten by a tick, because I think there are people out there that are concerned about the overuse of antibiotics and that that's not necessarily the first line of um, defense or evaluation. So just just throw it out, the, out there as a note that um, um, to make sure you cross all your T's and dot your I's. Oh, yeah. The uh, you know, the this was really kind of a, a getting all the ideas out there kind of a process. Um, and we look forward to going in depth with those and certainly before forming any kind of public advisory uh, statements, we would want experts to uh, help us to draft those. Yeah. Yeah, right, so that I would think that anything that comes out of the subgroup would have, would have to be approved by the full commission. Yeah. Anyway, so, you know, so I, yeah, we we got we have a work cut out for us. There's a lot of places to identify and a lot of people to talk to. This is going to be a process, but it's going to be interesting. Yeah. So. Great. Okay, so the next one is September. The next item is sort of planning for September presenters and Green Communities Grant. So. Yeah, so this September presenters is, uh, you'll notice that we didn't have anybody presenting from the city council or at large or um, uh, department heads. Uh, partly that was just because timing, we weren't sure when this was gonna meet. I got overwhelmed. It, it takes some organizing to get those in. Um, and also partly because at the last meeting, the suggestion was that we use those types of presentations to move forward with items in the capital improvement plan. Uh, so I want to just give a few moments at the moment to say, has anybody got ideas? Is anybody ready to step forward at the next meeting? Um, and or at least put a tickler out there to get ideas to me so we can get it on the agenda for next meeting. Um, to, uh, so instead of me reaching out and kind of saying to every commission is, do you want it to be your turn for um, presenting? Uh, you know, I think right now we need to have um, uh, commission commissioners kind of coming up with the ideas and bringing them to me or me and Carolyn so we can get it on the agenda. That's basically what this, unless anybody has an idea right now, they want to share something. Uh, if not, then I think that's my request is about it. Uh, Louis. Well, I, I'm the state board of building regulations and standards is going to is going to put out their nuts and bolts specifics about the energy code and the sort of the putting together what they think and uh, and it probably won't come until October but I was that's that's one thing I'd like to try to pull together as soon as the BBRS has has the the language of the code compared to the uh, DOER's version of what they'd like to have in the code and see how that shakes out. But again, they keep saying August, and then they said September, and now I, I believe that it'll be October. Okay, so I, I'm I'm hearing that it, it wouldn't be appropriate for you to present until that until the BBRS comes out. But we'll put that in. We'll put that in the hopper to come down. Okay, great. It's another way of saying I don't want to do it in September. Right, <laughs> not, not September, right? But 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 we'll, but we'll have it in the list. That's wonderful. Okay. Um, actually, I'll mention something else. Um. I've received one email. So the um, what is it? Inflation Reduction uh, Act, I always have a hard time remembering it because it really doesn't do that, um, but it does a lot of green stuff. Um, uh, I've heard that, I've, I've heard it put this way, that you know, right now if the city puts in a PV array, we can't take a, take a tax break for it because we're not profit. But my understanding is that we can now get uh, cash in lieu of tax break 
And I don't know if that's directly from the IRS or if you basically have a chance to sell the tax uh, qu uh, quantity to someone else who can pay you. But what that does is it opens up the possibility of the city owning our own PVRAs or more of them. We do own some, but every time we own one, we've had some kind of heavy subsidy from someone. Um, uh, so that opens up the possibility of us actually owning our own arrays and not having to share the profits with a third party financier of some kind. Um, uh, so number one, I don't really know what the new um, uh, tax structure is and how we would take advantage of it. And if anybody wanted to do a little research and present on that, um, that would be a huge help. It would save me a lot of time of doing the digging. And then the next thing would be um, that kind of starts opening up, you know, in my mind, I've never really prioritized PV arrays because the city doesn't, you know, we really can't do our own. We need to find some kind of grant or something to do it. If that's not the case anymore, I really want to start looking at city properties. And um, I'd love to have help from anybody who wants to do some research, present on that, and start seeing what we can do. So I'll just put that out there as something that we, I'm not going to volunteer to do that. I'd love commissioners to help if any way. Um, put that in the hopper though, too. Gordon? That might be a great thing for, you know, we're Rich and I were, and, and Rich were talking about doing this large scale evaluation of all of the mode space around the city. Hmm. And that would probably be a perfect opportunity for us when we're meeting with those stakeholders to say, you know, in these spaces that we're already maintaining, are they appropriate for pollinator habitat and or potentially solar PV? And so uh, I think that we could very easily do those evaluations simultaneously while we're while we're already evaluating open space for for doing pollinator habitat restoration. And I think that there's probably a, a decent amount of evidence to show that those two things work well side by side. Great. Now, um, actually, in that case, could you actually add in as you do this outreach? Uh, I know you're focusing on the ones with ornamental, but there's also some functional ones like you know, yeah. functional ones along the um, um, uh, the levees. I don't know if you could put a PV array on a levee or not, but there not might be on, no, not, okay. on the, not on the levee itself, but potentially adjacent as long as it weren't necessary for access to the so the grass is a part of the levee system itself the roots of the grass hold the soil in place so that has to remain on the levee right. uh, but in adjacent areas it might be excellent for pv or wildflower habitat certainly right. so i'm thinking in places where there actually still is functional mowing uh, you know, maybe some of those actually would be okay for a PV array. You know, so the PV array that's on the landfill doesn't, I mean, it doesn't supplant anything growing underneath it because it, it just sits on top of the landfill. Um, it's a ballast system. So, uh, but, yeah, so just anyhow, I, I wouldn't limit the, your questioning to the ornamental uh, as yeah. far as where PV might be. Uh, yeah. But that's a great, that's a great merging. Thank you. Great idea. Okay, hopefully we'll have ideas for presenters for the September meeting. <laughs> uh, last, uh, last item, uh, Carolyn, I grabbed that too. This is really yep. quickly, um, I had it in here because I thought I might need direction from the commission. I don't, but I'll just give you a heads up. Right now our green community grant covers um, uh, attic insulation and lead school. Um, try to shorten this little story to the shortest possible. When we applied for the grant, we, we asked the utilities, are there any incentives? They said no, very emphatically. Um, uh, by the time we got to implementing it, the new three-year plan had come out. And so I went back to the utilities through, the, uh, through um, one of their, their um, approved vendors, Center for Ecotechnology, uh, and had them look at the attic again. Nothing came of that. When we hired our contractors for the attic insulation, they looked at it and they said, wow, this, is, this would be open to, for a big subsidy. And I said, wow, okay, go for it. Give me a try, you know, give it a try. And they said, we just need to have someone come in and look at it before we start the project. They did. 
The project ended and I said, hey, anything ever come of the incentive that you're going to ask about? And so I said, well, let's check. And sure enough, there was a, what was it? It was a $39,195 subsidy. And the next week I got a form in because we wanted to actually hand that over to the vendor so that they would, they would buy down our costs, budgetary reasons why we do that. Uh, so I had to sign a form just to pass that over. The next day, a new form comes in and CET says, we just used their updated calculation numbers um, and you now are uh, eligible for an incentive of $81,900. <sighs> From nothing to $81,900. Anyhow, what it means uh, with the cost of the project plus some added costs, we had to move some duct work around to get this done and added on another $10,000. What the end thing is, is that it leaves about $44,400 of unused grant money that we probably won't be able to use. We're looking to see whether we could shift it over to the design of the HVAC um, design for heat pumps and, air, and, and energy recovery ventilation. That's gonna be up to the funder. We don't know if we can, but it's kind of irks me not to be able to spend $44,000 of grant money, but at the moment it looks like that's where it stands. I mean, I could try to stretch it out, but then we would lose any kind of possibility of a deadline to go after a half a million dollars to implement some of this stuff. So that's just a heads up. It's kind of a, an interesting little story and how the incentives for in, uh, insulation have just gone way up um, in the last, last plans. We'll just leave it at that. I was gonna ask for some directions, but I, it's pretty, pretty solid. I know which way I have to go now. DOER is kind of setting setting the, the direction. And that's it. Right. Thanks, Chris.